Amen. So it's been a minute since I've been in the pulpit on a Sunday morning. Uh, you know, I was, we had uh, somebody fill in last week. I was up in Phoenix. The week before that, we had Brother uh, uh, Oliver Gonzalez here. And then the week before that, I was sick. So um, feels like it's been a little while. But if you recall, we were going through our Distinctive Doctrine series. And so far, we've covered, uh, just going through that acronym, you know, that, that you often see, uh, the Baptist acronym. We've covered the biblical authority. We've covered the autonomy of the lo uh, local church. We've covered the priesthood of the believer. And we've covered the ordinances, the be uh, believer's baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then this morning, we're going to find ourselves in the I of that, back of that acronym, uh, which is going to stand for the individual soul liberty. And uh, really, you could apply this two different ways. And what I found with this acronym is that as you study this and you look into what, the way other people have taught it, and some of these letters, people apply it in different ways. They want to say it, actually, it stands for this or it stands for that. And that just goes to show you that we really are independent Baptists, that we can't even get our own acronym. Uh, we can't even agree on that as a whole. So, uh, But amen for that. But uh, really, the way this one I, I kind of want to apply this morning is just uh, really to the unbeliever and then to the believer, the way this would apply. So, what, But really what essentially it boils down to is that the, the doctrine of individual soul liberty simply means that every person has the right to believe as they see fit. Right. And these kind of things, kind of are these kind of acronyms or these doctrines are often birthed when because of the fact that people have gone through things and they want to they want to lay a foundation to make sure that uh, that error, the, the, the things that they suffer don't go through. Again, you have to remember the Baptists for a long time were persecuted for what they believed and told that they were not allowed to believe what they believe, even about a doctrine as simple as baptism. And they said that they had no right to establish a doctrine outside of, you know, a, a state-run church or, a, or, or a, you know, the Catholic Church wouldn't allow other people to preach anything different than what they believed. So <clears throat> our forefathers thought it was important that we understood this idea of individual soul liberty. That every one of us, not only as unbelievers, but also as believers, as we'll talk about towards the end of the sermon, uh, have the, uh, the right to believe as we see fit as individual people. So everybody has the right to believe as they see fit. Now, how would that apply to the unbeliever? Well, that would apply to the, uh, to the unbeliever that every person has the right to either choose or reject the gospel. And that's very contrary to a popular doctrine that we hear about a lot today, the doctrine of Calvinism, and specifically predestination. That, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, that, every, that God is, is, is uh, picking and choosing who's going to be saved and who's going to go to hell. Okay, but we don't believe that as Baptists. We believe that every person has the right to either choose the, uh, to believe the gospel or the right to reject the gospel. That's left up to the individual themselves. Uh, we also, you know, it also means that a, 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 a believer, and I also want to apply it this way, is that as believers, we have the right to determine, in fact, the responsibility uh, to determine what doctrines are biblical and what doctrines are unbiblical. You know, we're not going to just go along with whatever the church says simply because the church said so. You know, we need to be comparing these things, script, uh, spiritual things with spiritual and determining for ourselves why we believe what we believe. And we have the right and the responsibility to do that. But in each, and, uh, we'll just get right into it here. Uh, the, the first thing I want us to, to understand this morning is that individuals have the ability to accept or reject the gospel. Now notice I said ability. Okay, and that, again, that's contrary to the, 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 this Calvinistic doctrine of predestination of the believer, the belief that God has already chosen who will be saved and who will be damned. That God is, is somehow up in heaven before the world even began has decided, well, you're going to be saved and you're not. That's not, that's not a loving God. Right. I mean, God, I mean, saying that, that, what's the point of even trying to preach the gospel to these people? If, if, if God has already determined who's going to be saved yeah. and who's not. And really, quite often, I think that's why a lot of even independent Baptists are starting to allow that doctrine to creep in and are starting to fall under its spell a little bit because they, they, they get a little lazy, they get a little backslidden, and they, they, they still want to stop soul winning. Right. And so they say, well, they say things like, well, you know, if they're going to get saved, they're going to get saved. If God has decided that so-and-so is supposed to get saved, whether I preach them a gospel or not, somebody else will come along. That's not true, though. You know, that if, if you don't preach the gospel to be somebody, that might be their only chance to get right. saved. God's not just, you know, up there pulling strings and, 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 and has us all pre-programmed like a, some kind of a, you know, this isn't the matrix, right. you know, where, where it's just a bunch of ones and zeros and God's the, 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 the great programmer or whatever. And, 
and we're just running through, you know, some preordained, predestined, uh, you know, story. You know, this is something that we all play a part in. You know, it's, it, I think of those people out on the Navajo reservation. You know, if, if we don't go out into those two tracks and, and, right. and s slap around in the back of that van, you know, and, and bump our heads on the ceiling and, you know, we didn't bottom out any shocks, but, you know, it's possible, you know. If we don't go out there and do that, who else is going to do it? Probably nobody. That's right. Maybe a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon or something like that. But you can't, you're going to sit there and tell me, well, if that person back there is supposed to get saved, they will. Well, how? How, you know, how, how, they shall be, how shall they believe except uh, they, 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 uh, they, they, uh, they hear the word. They have the word preached to them. And how shall they preach except they be sent? So don't let this, this and this is, this is why it has to be touched upon in this sermon, is because this kind of thinking and this kind of doctrine creeps into Baptist churches. Even independent, fundamental Baptist churches that would, and, you know, and all, to all appearances have the gospel right. They would, you would say they believe the right gospel. Even then they can let this thinking creep in to where they end up saying things like, well, God will just save who he wants saved and they'll show up here at our doorstep. That's not how it works. Right. In fact, predestination, this, the, the concept, the manner in which the Calvinist teaches it is contrary to the nature of God. That's what I believe. Because think about it. If God is choosing who will be saved and who will be damned, that's contrary to the nature of God. Yep. You're telling, that's not love then. The people in hell, God, you're going to tell me God loves the people in hell? Now how can you say that God so loved the world if he's already preordained some people to go to hell? In fact, the vast majority of people are going to go to hell. Broad is the way which leads to the destruction, and many there being which go in there at. So God, just, with, just right out of the gate, just hates the majority of people. Well, then John 3.16 is a lie. For God so loved the world is a lie. That's against the nature of God to say that he is, he is preordaining who is going to be saved and preordaining who is not going to be saved or who is going to be damned. It's contrary to a multitude of scriptures. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because... We're all saved here this morning, and I think there's another concept that we really need to, to make sure we have nailed down. But we could just think, probably go around the room, and we could probably all think of a few verses that would, that are just, that would debunk this idea that God is picking and choosing who's going to be saved and who isn't. <clears throat> For example, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish. Right. God, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but the Calvinist will tell you, no, God willed that some people would go to hell. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many should all come to repentance? Everyone. God wants everyone to be saved. John 1, 6, For there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. How many men did God want to believe? All men. Not just some. And we could go on and on. 1 Timothy 4.10, 1 John 2.2, 2, John 3.16, 1 Timothy 2. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You could turn to Matthew 23 and, and read uh, Jesus as he was coming in to Jerusalem before he was crucified and said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thee together even as a, as a, a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings and ye would not. So he would have saved them. He would have, he would have been their Messiah, but they chose to reject him. Right. So this concept that God predestines who's going to be saved is contrary to the doctrine of individual soul liberty. Every person, as an unbeliever, has the right, the ability, to choose whether or not they're going to believe or reject the gospel. And that's why it's so important for us that we go out and preach the gospel. It's contrary to the nature of God to say that God is picking and choosing who goes to, heaven, who goes to hell and who doesn't. Because what sends a person to hell? It's sin, right? Sin, you know, the, 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 the wages of sin is death, right? We understand that that's part of that death is our spiritual death when we go to hell. So to imply, to say there, to sit there and say that what God chooses some men to go to hell, well, you're kind of saying, well, now it's not even about sin that takes them to hell. Now it's more about because just God decided that's the way it is. In fact, it, it almost starts to imply that God forces men to sin. I mean, if that's what's going to take people to go to uh, hell, if that's what takes people to go to hell is them having to commit sin, then, you know, they would have to, that means that if God wanted someone to go to hell, then they would have to sin, wouldn't they? And we know that God is not, cannot be tempted with uh, evil, neither tempteth he any man. Let no man when he is tempted, uh, but ever, uh, say when he is tempted, excuse me, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then lust, when it, when it hath conceived, bringeth forth sin, and when it's sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. So this doctrine is just completely false. It's not something we should entertain. 
and it's wicked and it casts God in a bad light, quite frankly. It makes him look like this just this cold, heartless being who is just choosing, you know, based on what, I don't know who's going to be saved and who's going to go to a lake of fire for all of eternity. I mean, it's a, I mean, hell is a serious place. You know, we shouldn't take it lightly. To just, so just say that, well, God is just on a whim, just sending people there just because he feels like it is wicked. Now, the reason people get mixed up on this is because of the terms that are used. Terms like predestination or predetermined or preordained or words like ordained or uh, you know, these, are these type of terms that get thrown around and people have a, have a misconception of exactly, not necessarily what it means, but the way in which it's being used and what it's referring to. And we see an example of that there in Ephesians chapter 1. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, just uh, pick it up there in, in uh, verse 3 where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blame before him in love. So let's say, we'll see there in verse 4, it says he hath chosen us in him. So they'll say that means some people go to heaven and some go to people go to hell based on whether or not God has chosen them. But this, the way it's using chosen there is, does not mean to the exclusion of other people. You know, he hasn't chosen us to, so that others would be excluded. It's we're chosen, what? In him. That's what the choosing is, that we're chosen in him. You know, the way we're going to go to heaven is through Christ. It's not, it's not, do you see what I'm saying there? It's not about God picking and choosing somebody. It's the fact that if you're going to heaven, you're chosen in him. Right. We are chosen in him that we should be holy and blame, without blame. That's what's predetermined. That if you're going to come to, 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 uh, to the Father, it's going to be through Christ. No man cometh in the Father but by me, Jesus said. That's what's being predetermined. The manner, uh, in, uh, the, 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 the way that you're going to get to heaven is in him. That if you're going to be holy and without blame before him in love, it's going to be in Christ. It goes on there in verse 5 and it says, um, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of of children by uh, Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So see, see there? Some people are predestined. And it says there we have been predestinated, right? Having been predestinated unto the adoption of, uh, uh, of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Now does that mean that because you're predestined that you're, God chose you uh, and, and excluded somebody else? No. That God drew your name out of a hat and said, oh, you're one of my chosen? Right. Drew another name out of a hat and said he is not? That's not, that's not how it works. What he's predestined, it says there is, we are predestinated unto the adoption, just like we are chosen in him. We are predestinated unto the adoption by Jesus Christ. That if you're going to be God's child, if you're going to be adopted, if you're going to be an heir of salvation, it's by Jesus Christ. It's not talking about who, it's talking about the how. You're predestinated to be adopted by Jesus Christ. You see, you're not going to be made holy. You're not going to be made without blame by any other way than through Jesus Christ. Look there at verse 11. It says, In whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Let's see, there again. And I'll just pick out a word. Now, you can turn to just some... There, there's no false... You could pick any false doctrine you want, and you could find a scripture to, to twist and make it sound, say what you want it to say. Say, well, we believe in predestination because the Bible uses the word predestination. We have a way, how does it use it? What's it referring to? What's the context? It says we're predestinated. Look there in verse 11. We have an obtained inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. The sentence continues in verse 12, that we should be pray to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. The predestination is that you should be to the praise of his glory. That's what God has de before uh, uh, determined. That those of us that come to Christ, that we are going to bring him glory in heaven. That's what's being predestinated here. Again, it's, it's the what. It's the how. It's not about the who. It's not about who's getting picked and who isn't. It's about those people that are saved, what, is, uh, what lies ahead for them. Yeah. And what lies ahead for us is that we should be to the praise of his glory. <clears throat> we are predestinated to bring him Praise. This ties in with 1 Peter chapter 2. Go ahead and turn over there real quick. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, beginning of verse 9, the Bible says, But ye are a chosen generation. Right? Now, see that right there. Well, there you have it. 
some people are picked and some people aren't. No, that's not what it's saying here. Because again, if you're going to say that, if you're going to turn to this scripture or another scripture in Ephesians 1 and say, well, it says predestinated, that some we are chosen, well, then that's, and you're going to interpret it that way to say that God picks and chooses who's going to be saved. Now you've just created a huge glaring contradiction in scripture because of all the scriptures I read earlier that said that God is not willing that any should perish. Now you have a contradiction and the Bible cannot contradict itself. So we have to understand, you know, we already understand that God wants everybody to be saved. So now when we read these verses and we read, ye are a chosen generation, it's, we now understand it's not talking about the fact that we're being picked by, with, no, uh, in, in, with, with no act of will on our own part. That God just has, has just predestined us. We can't even help it. We're just going to be saved. Irresistible grace. These other doctrines that they teach. <clears throat> it says we are uh, a chosen generation to do what? That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of dar darkness. You're chosen to do something. You're chosen to be a royal priest at a holy nation that ye should show forth his praises who hath called you. That's what we've been called unto. That's what we've been chosen to do. That's what we're predestined to, to bring him glory and praise. And it's all done through Christ. So God predetermines the fate of those that are foreknown. And really, that's the term we really need to come to grasp with. And that's the term a lot of Calvinists want to ignore, is that, that term foreknowledge. Right. Because when you understand foreknowledge, predestination makes a whole lot more sense. God predestinates things based on his foreknowledge. God foreknows everybody who's going to be saved. That doesn't mean he picked who's going to be saved. Just because you know something ahead of time doesn't mean that's you made it happen. You know, <coughs> I'm trying to think of some, some carnal examples but that involve food, but we're not going to go there for the sake of time. But, <coughs> you know, God predetermines the fate of those who he has foreknown. <coughs> God, because God knows all things, right? God is all, all knowing. He knows the beginning from the end. The Bible says in Isaiah 46, verse 9, I'll read to you, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I shall do all my pleasure. God says that he declares the end from the beginning. That, when th that from the beginning, God already knows the end. Right. And he declares the things that are not yet done. The things that are going to come to pass. God has foreknowledge. God already knows who's going to be saved and who isn't. But that doesn't mean he picked them. Yep. What he has determined for those people is that they should bring him glory. Right. That they should be, pre be, uh, be to his praise. That they should be conformed to the image of his son. That is what God has predestinated us to. <clears throat> and there's a lot of other uh, you know, scriptures that we could turn to and look at. But... Um, I think we get the point on that, and I, and I kind of want to move on. I, and I, hopefully I'm not just touching and going on that, but I think we all get that. I, think everyone, I don't think anyone you know, is, is teetering on the brink of going into full-blown Calvinism this morning. You know, and if you are, if that's you, if you're really struggling with this, come talk to me, and we can look at some other, you know, we can turn to Romans 8, we can turn to Romans 14, we can look at these other passages. But uh, <clears throat> what I want to kind of focus in on uh, this morning is the fact uh, that you as a believer have you know someone who's already chosen to re receive the gospel by your own free will right you have the individual liberty because remember that's what we're talking about this morning is the individual liberty the the, the individual liberty that you have to re to either reject the gospel or to believe it not only that but you as a believer have the the liberty to deny or reject doctrine that is taught in a church and this is important because now there's some caveats here we're going to get into now, because here's the thing, some churches will, will teach things that you might not agree with. Does that mean you can't go there? You know, does that mean you shouldn't, you, sh you shouldn't even go darken the door of that church? Well, you have to kind of take some things into account, like what exactly are they teaching? What specific doctrine are we, you know, talking about? Because, and this is important, because some people today, you know, they get all bent out of shape because some church preaches a pre-trib doctrine. Now, I sat in a church for, for over a decade where the pre-trib was believed. It necessarily wasn't taught because it's hard to teach that doctrine and make any sense because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but people go to churches and, you know, people become post-trib. They read the Bible. They read Matthew 24 where it says after the tribulation. Yeah. You know, they, they read all these passages. They, they, they read the Bible for themselves. They come to that, you know, uh, that, uh, that de determination by themselves. And then they end up going to a church that doesn't believe that. Is that a doctrine that you should separate over? No, I don't think it is. You know, some, and some people will make a big stink and say, no, you should. I don't believe that. I, I believe that you have the 
you have the responsibility to be in church. Because here's the thing, if you decide, if you decide that's going to be a, a, a deal breaker for you as far as a church goes, you're going to have a hard time finding a Baptist yes. church. You, know, you're, you just narrowed your, your, your selection down quite a bit. <clears throat> because a lot, they all believe it. The vast majority of them, at least in America, they believe it, that, that by and large. So what I'm talking about is the fact that you, as, a, as, a, as somebody who's attending a local church, you have the right and responsibility to choose whether or not you believe what is preached as doctrine by this church. And go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Now that doesn't just mean that you just have a license to just teach whatever you want, you know, or to, to uh, you know, object beyond reason. Where now you're going to make it a point of contention over some doctrine, some trivial, you know, uh, tertiary doctrine, some peripheral doctrine that isn't one of the main tenets of the faith. Now, you're, now that's going to be your hobby horse. And we'll talk a little bit of that. But you do, as an individual, have the right and the responsibility to either reject or accept the doctrine that is taught by a church. Look there in Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, where it says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. You know, so if somebody comes in and they believe some weird doctrine, or they, if they've got something wrong in their doctrine biblically, they're a little off on something, the Bible says it doesn't say to just reject that person out of hand and have nothing to do with them. You know, call them a heretic and, and beat them with the rod out the door, you know, and tell them never to come back. No, it says to receive them. They're weak in the faith. Receive them. You know, give them time. Admonish them. Show them from the Bible why, why they're wrong. Teach them. Allow them to grow. Let the, let the preaching come across the pulpit and begin to correct them. You know, let that happen. And, and receive them, but not to doubtful dis disputations. That's where that caveat comes in. You know, where somebody's going to come in a, bring in a, a strange uh, doctrine or a, or a wrong doctrine, that's fine, but as long as it doesn't lead to doubtful disputation, you know, disputings, people that are going to make contention out of it. Well, I'm going to tell you why the earth is flat, you know. I believe the flat earth, and by the time I'm done with this church, everybody will. You know, ain't going to happen. You know, or, or, or whatever strange doctrine that's out there today. You know, the Nephilim, you know, the lizard people, or <laughs> Bigfoot. All these strange things that people that spend too much time on YouTube get into. And they want, now they find a local church, you know, and, and, they, you know, and they, they go in there, and now they have this doubtful disputation. They're weak in the faith. They're not church. They're not read up in their Bible. You know, they've been, they've been up till 2 in the morning you know, watching, you know, some conspiracy stuff or whatever. And, and I'm all for that, you know, some of that stuff. There's some good conspiracy videos out there. But that's not the meat and potatoes of the Christian life. Right. You know, this is right here. Right. Getting in this book. And we should, you know, if we just spent more time on this, getting into this, we would have right doctrine. So he says not to receive them to doubtful disputation. So there is a line there. You know, where somebody, if they're bringing in something and they're just making a, po a point of contention, they're not going to give it up after they've been corrected then you know then we have to sit sit down and have a talk but it goes on in verse 2 it says for one that believeth uh, be that he may eat all things another who is weak eateth herbs okay so specifically what he's talking about here is that there's some people who are saying well you shouldn't eat meat you know they're vegetarians and he's saying you know that's fine let them be a vegetarian you know but don't let them impose that upon you don't make that a matter of di you know dispute uh, for one believeth that he may eat all things, another... Now, it is worth noting, he who is weak eateth herbs, right? <laughs> Push the salad aside and have a double portion of the meat, right? Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, you know? If somebody says, hey, I don't eat meat, don't despise that guy. You know, that's fine. That's their choice. And let not him which eateth judge not him, uh, uh, not judge him that eateth. So don't let the vegetarian come in and say, hey, why, aren't you, why are you eating meat? Don't you know that's murder? You know, don't let them go to the pescatarian. I think that's what it is. They only eat fish, right? Is it pescatarian? I don't know. Nobody here knows. Is it, I got okay. I got the head nod. I'm good. So the you know go hey just because you can't hear them scream doesn't mean it's not murder. <laughs> you know that fish had a, has a life. You think that's you laugh? I've seen it. Yeah. People who are come approaching people out in public, fishing and saying that fish has a right to live. And calling people out in public. Did anyone see that Facebook video? That guy who just went off on that dude in the park. I'm thinking, man. If I even if I felt that way, I would. First of all, if guys taking his time on, on his day off and he's down at the park, and and he's he's fishing, you know, 
He might be he might be a, a little bit of an outdoorsman. He might be one of those, you know, a little bit more of a roughneck. I don't know if he'd be approaching strange men who are fishing and start running my mouth at him. You never know. He might be in there with the fishes before you know it. <laughs> <coughs> that didn't happen, but this guy's just going off, you know, calling the cops, th throws the guy's fish back in after he catches it. You know, what's he doing? He's judging him that, that eateth not. You know, he's despising him. It's a doubtful disputation. <coughs> and it says there, for God hath received him. So if it's a believer in Christ, if it's a brother in Christ, you know, there's more important doctrines. There's more important things that we need to focus on than some, as something as, as silly as, you know, whether or not we're going to eat meat. Now it says there in verse 4, and this is kind of the thrust of it, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. <clears throat> so we should really be more concerned with what we believe and what we're going to decide we believe than what somebody else is believing. Right? He goes on, Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One steameth one day above another, another esteem every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You know, don't be so, if someone doesn't want to celebrate birthdays, you know, more cake for you. You know, then you don't have to get him a gift. Praise God, right? You know what a pain that is. But, I'm kidding, but, you know, <clears throat> he's just saying, look, don't sit here and judge each other over, you know, some people, and I've seen people come into churches and say, they're, they're big, they're, whether or not I'm coming to church is whether or not you celebrate Christmas. Do you put a Christmas, you know, go to the pastor, write him a letter. You know, I, I, I hear you celebrate Christmas, is that true? You know, I'd love to be a member here, but if you guys decorate a tree on Christmas, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. Bacon. Yeah, right, or bacon. Yeah, hit the road, Jack. <laughs> There's going to be bacon getting eaten around here. You better believe it, okay? But people make these kind of silly things. This is, this is what makes or breaks their church membership. You know, they esteem one day above another. They don't esteem uh, the day the same way somebody else does. Or they, they don't like the way somebody else esteems a certain day. And they say, oh, I can't believe you celebrate Christmas. You know, it's pagan holiday. So is everything else in the world. I mean, everything is pagan to these people. <coughs> So what it's showing us here is that we all have the right to act in accordance to our own conscience, right? In verse 4, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. You know, every man shall give an account of himself to God. So we should be more concerned with our own doctrine, our own beliefs, than we are what somebody else is believing. And it also shows us that we have the right to act in accordance as our conscience dictates. You know, you, know who, you, don't, you don't owe me an explanation for why you believe what you believe. You owe that to God. And, and we'll get into why you know, it's not such a big deal because if we're all believing the same book, we're all going to end up believing the same thing for the most part, by and large. And there's going to be small things that we probably differ on, but that's good. That's healthy. You know, that's, that means people are reading the Bible. They're thinking about what they're hearing. They're thinking about their reading. They're contemplating these things. They're not just going along out of, uh, of just, you know, like robotically. You know, they're, they're, they're involved. So you have the right to act in accordance to your own conscience. You will answer to your own master. You will stand or fall uh, based on what you believe. We don't have to go around policing one another in this area. It says there in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, I'll read to you, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone re may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So it's not saying good, bad is in the sense of sinful, but what it, you know, it's, it's whether or not your works were, were good and right, the motivations were right, or whether they weren't. And uh, you know, it says that every, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, I, you know, your, our pastor isn't going to just go and, and stand in our place for all of us. You know, and, and, and he's going to be responsible for everything that everybody believed in his church. You know, we're all going to give an account for whether or not w for the things that we did. We're all going to rise or fall based on our own merit. And God's going to hold us accountable as individuals. Therefore, because God is going to hold you accountable as an individual, you have the right as an individual to determine what it is that you believe. The Bible says, look there in verse 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You know, because I'm going to give an account to myself before God, and I can't just say, well, brother so-and-so, or pastor so-and-so told me so, you know, that's why he's going to say, no, you should have known. You right. should have figured that out. That was your responsibility. So yes, individual soul, it's a liberty. It's a right, but it's also a responsibility that we have before God. You know, if a doctrine or a practice is upheld by a, by a church that goes against what you personally believe, you have the right to disagree. 
because you're going to give an account to that. Now, obviously, that's within there. You know, you, you can't go overboard with that. They're they're all because the fact is, you know, you might have the right to to uphold your own beliefs that are contrary to what the church teaches or what's taught across the pulpit. But you also have to understand that the church or church leadership also has the right to draw lines and so that cannot be crossed. You know that well, they have that right because they're we're, you know we're going to give an account too and say, look, there's certain things that y if you're going to go here, you have to believe, right. right? And that that should go without saying, you know. But not every single thing, you know. If you're going to come here, you should probably believe in the King James Bible, right? Right? You know, or you're just you're going to get tired of it. If you're going to come here, you should you're going to have to believe that salvation is by grace through faith. Right. You know, you don't have to. You don't have to believe that to to to, to walk through the doors. We'll, we'll we'll work on you. know, come on in. We'll work on that, right? But you're not going to go around soul winning, telling people that faith is you know salvation is by works and be a part of this church, right. because that is a damnable heresy, and that's really where the line is drawn. Damnable heresies, you know, we're teaching people to sin that some sin is okay or excusable. So there are lines that are drawn, but you know, within that there is space for us to disagree with one another. We don't all have to believe the exact same thing on every little minutia of Scripture and have every single little thing, you know, all lined up. Um, <coughs> that that's just not that's just it's 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 unreasonable to think that. And uh, you have the right to disagree. Now, if a church is going to say, hey, there's certain lines that you cannot cross, there's certain things that you must believe, those lines should be very clear. They should be very distinct. Everyone should know where they are. And I feel like, you know, if you're here at Faithful Word Baptist Church, you know, probably know where those lines are. You know, we've already talked about some salvation by grace through faith, the King James Bible, the preservation of scriptures, so on and so forth. I'm sorry, what was that? Oneness. Yeah, oneness. Yeah, we, we had to bring that up, didn't we? <laughs> Just in case you haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> You know, if you deny the Trinity or the eternal sonship of Christ, this church is not for you. You know, you can take your sorry carcass over to Jacksonville, Florida, and go hang out there. You know, I've I heard that the doors are open. So, and anyway, I don't want to go on about that. Um, but yeah, oneness is another one. You know, the nature of God. You know, there are certain things that you can't, that you, yeah, you have to line up with the church. But it's not because it's the church saying, well, that's just what we believe because that's, because we just want to, you know, domineer and control your life. You know, it's because that's what the Bible teaches. Because it could, these things are, couldn't be more crystal clear from the Bible. You know, and, and when you start, you know, changing the nature of who God is or what the nature of salvation is, then yeah, there's a problem there. You know, then, then we need to, we need, probably need to separate and go ways. <clears throat> you know, but the church, is, the, the, what's really important, but the, the reason we want to preach this and understand this is because you don't want to fall in the trap of letting a church dictate to you what you must believe in, in, in these smaller areas of life. And churches do this. You know, they'll say, hey, you should not read the Bible for yourself. Well, the Bible says we should be <laughs> reading the Bible for ourselves. There are some churches that will, you know, even outside of the Baptist faith, especially that will start to tell you that you have to believe this because we said so. And it's not even a matter of what the scripture says. This is secondary to them. You have to believe this because this is what our church teaches. And that's it. Bottom line. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. We don't care. Well, you know, our, our, our church trumps the Bible. You know, and that's not what we believe. When I mean, we started out with biblical authority, that was the B in Baptist. That is the foundation. This book, if it doesn't line up with this book, then we throw it out. We don't want anything to do with it. So we should understand that. The Bible says, I mean, Jesus rebuked people for this kind of an attitude. You know, the Pharisees, he called them hypocrites. He said, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people dryeth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is, vain, is far from me. But in vain they do uh, worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And that's really where the church has to draw the line for itself. To say, we can only teach the, com we can only teach, uh, the doctrines of God. We can only teach the commandments of men. We cannot get up here and preach the commandments of men as the doctrines of God. I can't get up here and say, well, this is my personal preference and you all have to abide by that. You know, this is my opinion and, if you, and, and I know I don't have a, a leg to stand on scripturally, but if you want to come here, you have to do the same thing and start teaching things that are our, our own opinions, our own personal beliefs as the doctrines of God. And that's what Jesus was rebuking them for, for de teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That's not biblically based. It's just something that our church made up. So, 
the church leadership, they have to draw lines. They, the church has to draw lines of saying, look, this is, this is a certain doctrine that we uphold that cannot be crossed. You have to be within these bounds. And they should be clear, they should be distinct, and they should also, those lines should find their source and authority in Scripture. They shouldn't be these, these doctrines of men that are just made up. Go ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're going to look at one particular doctrine that this would rub a lot, a, a lot of people the wrong way. And this would rub the fur the, the wrong way. But as I've you know, heard so eloquently spoken once, if, the, if I'm rubbing the fur the wrong way, the cat can turn around. Right? Because it's what the Bible says. Right. <clears throat> so such lines, such the, the point I'm trying to make here is that when we teach something as a doctrine, as saying this is the way it's going to be in this church, it has to find its source in Scripture. This has to be the authority. This is what we have to appeal to. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. That, that right there is going to set some people off. That's going to set these people off right over here across the hall. Right. You know, with their, with their female preacher, right. with their female pastor. Yeah. You know, did they, did they not read that in seminary? Right. Or is it just this isn't their final authority? Right. And that they have their own doctrines that they're teaching. So it's saying right there, I mean, that couldn't be any clearer. It says they are to not to speak in the church. And it goes on, it says, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also say at the law, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So we as a church have the right to get up and say, look, there will never be a woman preacher behind this pulpit. Right. Period. Because that's what the Bible says. I didn't write this. And if people don't like that, too bad. Right. You know, uh, that's what it says. <clears throat> He says, What came the word God out from you, or came it unto you only? <clears throat> if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto him are the commandments of the Lord. Right. You know, he's saying, Look, you want to know if you're right with God or not? You want to, you know, whether or not you're spiritual? Well, then acknowledge this as the truth. And uh, there'd be a lot of people that are they're proclaiming themselves to be very spiritual today, right? But they're not acknowledging what Paul wrote. Right. You know, the Joyce Myers of the world. Right. You know, they want to put themselves out to these great preachers. These great, these prophetesses, you know, and these, 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 these just devout spiritual women, but they don't acknowledge what Paul wrote here. In fact, they have whole books written to, to dismiss Paul, what Paul really meant. Well, Paul was just a woman hater. It was the culture. They write these kind of things to dismiss this so that they can get up and preach. So we see here, <coughs> again, this is a perfect example of a church saying, yes, you have the right to believe as an individual as you see fit, but there are certain lines that are very clear and distinct in Scripture that cannot be crossed within a church. And women keeping silent is a very clear command in Scripture. I mean, it couldn't be any clearer. <clears throat> now, what if we were to start dictating other behaviors about women in the church and saying it was, it was the commandment that you must do it this way? Like saying, in this church, women will feed their, their women in X, Y, Z manner. You know, they will pitch a tent in the parking lot and any time they need to feed their child, they will go in there, they will wear a burqa on the way to the tent, and when they are in the tent, they may remove the burqa and then feed their child, right? If we were to start saying something like that, then that would be out of line, right? right? And here's the other, here's the other, other extreme, you know, other, other, we, we can't sit here and say, well, you know, you must, you, you, I don't want to get into it a lot because it's really not, it's not really, a, we'll spend a lot of time on it. But we, we can't sit here and dictate how women are going to feed their children in a church. That's right. And how they're not. Whether they're going to they're gonna breastfeed uncovered or covered. That's your personal preference. Right. You know, and you get to decide how you want to do that. And I'm not going to get up and you say, well, why say that? Because there's been churches that do that. Yep. That say, you must go to the broom closet and, and go sit in the bathroom stall and, and, and make sure no one knows what's going on in there right. when you feed your child. I mean, it's ridiculous. Right. These churches, they're so squeamish about it. And this is a whole subject, you know, that we could probably get into a little bit tonight with this idea of thinking that, that you, you know, it's some kind of a sin to, to breastfeed your child publicly. It's not, okay? Right. And the church can't get up and tell you that it is because they have no scriptural basis for that. Right. That's your personal preference. And I can't teach that as the commandment of God. Now, what's interesting here is verse 36. and It says this in verse 36. What came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? He doesn't really answer that, does he? But when, you, when we think about that question in the context here, 
<clears throat> he's saying, look, did, the, did the, the word of God come out from you? What's the answer to that? No, it didn't. You don't get to just make up whatever you think the, the Bible says. Or came unto you, uh, unto you only. Look, the, the word only came unto us. We can only come to it and see what it says and determine what we believe based on what it says. I can't go, well, I can't come to you and say, well, I'm speaking to you the words of God and tell you whatever I believe and say, well, this is, this is scripture, this is authority. The word came unto us only. And uh, <coughs> that question, you know, determines the authority and that the authority is scripture and not our own selves. So <coughs> he says there, he answers and says, the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You know, the things that I'm writing, the word that's coming to you, these are the commandments of the Lord. And they're very clear, aren't they? And if we're spiritual, we're going to acknowledge them. We're going to say the things that Paul wrote, this book, are the things of the Lord. These are the commandments of God. And that's how we're going to determine what we believe. And that's how you're going to have, for the most part, by and large, harmony and unity in a church, is when we all agree that this is our authority. From the pulpit to the pew and everywhere in between. If we all let this be our final authority, then everything's going to fall into place. You know, we're all going to end up believing, for, for the most part, everything the same way. And the things that we differ on are probably going to be matters of our own personal preference. <coughs> and it says there, if we, if we are spiritual, acknowledge them. But the, the fact is, if somebody refuses it, what does he say about them? But if it, verse 38, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, don't kowtow, don't bend, don't say, don't try to, well, maybe, you know, change what the Bible says to, to appease somebody else who's just being ignorant. Just let him be ignorant in that area. <coughs> so what he says there when he's saying, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. You know what that means? Is that you have the right to be wrong. That's what you have in a church. You know, that's what individual soul liberty means. You have the right to determine what you believe for yourself. And that means you have the right to be wrong. And you know what? We're, no one's going to have it right all the time. None of us. Sometimes we're going to go to the Bible and, and, and get something wrong. And this is just something to keep in mind because... You know, as the church grows and we have more people, and, 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 and I've seen this, especially in Phoenix, where new guys come in and, they, and, and people have a fresh look on things, and someone will preach something or say something, and they'll be talking about the Bible, and then somebody will kind of just will, will challenge that person on their interpretation of a scripture. And people get so touchy about it because, because you know, they've just had this long-held belief about what they think a certain passage means. And then somebody challenges them a little bit on that, and you know, they instantly want to say, well, this guy's being heretical, or this guy's just like, well, no, maybe. Maybe that guy has a, a clear understanding. You know, that's the great thing about fresh blood in a church, or people who are new to the faith coming in. You know, people that have been reading the Bible and taught the Bible, and have come to just kind of be set in their ways, like, this is how this passage is interpreted, there's only one way to understand this, or they just have some kind of conception about what this passage means. You know, they kind of get set in their ways, and they, never, they can never maybe see the, a deeper meaning or a different meaning, or the, maybe even the correct meaning in some instances. And then some fresh blood comes in. There's someone who's read the Bible maybe the, the, just a few times, and they've got, they don't have preconceived notions about a passage, and then they challenge somebody on that. You know, that's a good thing. We should allow people to challenge us on Scripture. Now, I'm not saying if someone wants to come to you and say, well, was Jesus eternally the Son of God? You know, we, that's a line that we're not going to cross. We've already determined that. You know, is God three persons or is he just one? Or whatever. Is salvation by faith or is it, you know, works involved? Is it predestination? You know, that there are certain lines. But if someone wants to come to you and challenge you on, you know, some interpretation of some passage or some, some meaning of something, you know, not, that doesn't mean that you should just cast them off. You know, we should allow, we should hear what they're saying and maybe consider it in the light of Scripture. So you have the right to be wrong. You have the right to be corrected. You have the right to to disagree, you know, I'm not saying if you disagree, you're automatically wrong, but I'm just saying you have that right to be, to believe what you want. And you should develop your beliefs and how, what you believe, your life based on your understanding of the scripture. That's what it boils down to. That you as an individual, you need to determine what you believe for yourself. You know, by all means, use the preaching. By all means, use the, the reading of the word of God to determine that. But at the end of the day, you can't just say, well, I believe that because Pastor So-and-so believes that. Because that's what Faithful Word teaches. That's the only reason you believe it. Well, what if we change on something? Not that we're ever going to, but what if we did make some major change on some, you know, very important, essential doctrine? Are you going to change with us? 
Or have you determined what you believe for yourself? You have the right to do that. You have the responsibility to that. You need to base your life and your underst uh, on the understanding, your understanding of Scripture. That's why the Bible says in 2 Timothy, kind of getting ahead of myself here, but it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It said, Study to show thyself approved. You need to study to show yourself approved. You know, the Bible says that the, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. You know, the guy who's getting up and preaching, he's subject to, I'm subject to you. You know, Paul praised the Bereans because they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these, be, these things be so. He said they're more noble than those in Thessalonica because they didn't just hear what Paul said and said, well, I must settle it. They went, oh, that's what he said. And then they, they searched the scriptures and said, you know, he's right. Or, you know, maybe, maybe get, I'll get up and say something and you'll go home and read the Bible and say, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. You know, you have the right to do that. Uh, you have the responsibility to do that. I mean, that's why God gave us the church. That's why he gave us, as it says in Ephesians 4, apostles, and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. You know, we should be re hearing the things that, that we hear. We should hear the preaching. We should receive it. And then we should study for ourselves to see whether these things be so. So you have, the, you have that liberty as an individual to determine for yourself what you believe. But again, as I've already touched upon, you're not at liberty to preach heresy. That's where the line is drawn. You know, the Bible says in Titus 3, uh, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. You know, we love to apply that out soul winning, and it applies, but that's within the church walls too. You know, if somebody comes in here and they start preaching heresy, they're going to get two admonitions, and then it's going to be, well, there's the door. And you say, well, what are the heresies? Well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. You know, if you're worried that you're preaching a damnable heresy, just let's find out. <laughs> come talk to me. <laughs> you're probably not, though, right? You know? <coughs> I mean, it, it, you, have that you have a liberty up to a point. You can't go around just preaching blatant heresy. And here's another thing. You're not at liberty to live in willful sin. You know, if, you're, if you say, well, I don't think that's a sin, what I'm doing. And it is a sin? Well, that's just my personal belief. That's just my, I have that liberty. No, the church has very clear things. that you, There are certain things that are not allowed or tolerated within the church. In 1 Corinthians 5, and there's, that's been talked about and discussed at length. You can go read it for yourself. I'm sure we're all familiar with, with, with those things. You're not at liberty to live in willful sin. Does that mean you have to be sinless and perfect? No, but there are certain things that you cannot be found guilty of as a church member. You, are to, you will be disciplined for. The Bible says in Galatians 5, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. You know, Don't use this liberty that you have in Christ to think that, well, since I'm not going to be condemned for my sin, and, and being condemned to hell that I can just live however I want with no consequences. Right. There are going to be consequences. There will be consequences even within the local church. <clears throat> so you have the right to, to believe as you see fit. And there are certain lines that are drawn. You know, heresy, willful sin, you know, certain sins. And then, you know, there's also, the, you, you shouldn't be going around you know, trying to force others to believe against their will. You know, that's, that's really what it, it kind of boils down to. That's what liberty is all about, is that we all have the right to believe as we see fit. And we don't have to all try to just pry each other into our, uh, another person's mold and say, you have to be just like me in every regard. You know, my Christmas tree is approximately this high. You know, I get, I get uh, what kind do we get? Is it evergreen? I don't know. We get the conifer? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. We get one of those ones from Oregon, you know, those really nice ones. You know, and it's, so that's the Christmas tree you have to have, you know. And I like silver tinsel, and we only use the red bulbs, and, uh, you know. I can't, I, this, is, this is the kind of things that people do, though. They, they get into these strange things where they want to make everybody believe exactly like them on every little thing. That's just not practical, and it's not reality. If you're there, if you, I probably didn't have you keep anything there, but go back to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. You have the right to believe what you want within to a certain degree. You could still believe whatever you want, but you'll just suffer the consequences if you cross certain lines. That's what it comes down to. But you also have the responsibility to, to make sure that what you're believing is correct, that the things that you're being taught are correct, that you're, you're uh, weighing these things out, that you're searching the scriptures. <clears throat> it says in Romans 14, verse 13, Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. 
So instead of sitting here trying to make everybody do everything that the way we want it done, we should probably be more concerned that what we're doing isn't being, uh, you know, uh, going to cause somebody else to fall. You know, and that within the context of, you know, going back to eating meat, Paul said, if, if meat causeth my brother to offend, I, you know, he wouldn't eat meat for the, to the end of the world. He said, I'll stop. I'll quit eating. You know, I became, to all men, I became all things to all men. You know, if, if, if me eating meat, you know, we know that meat, uh, meat sacrificed unto an idol is nothing. We know that an idol is nothing. But if some brother who's weak in the, in the faith sees us eating meat sacrificed unto an idol, and this isn't happening in the United States, but it, this is applicable in other parts of the world. And he says, whoa, this guy's claiming to be a Christian, but he's eating this meat. Well, in that case, for conscience sake, not for meat's sake, for the, not our own conscience, but the conscience of a weak brother in the faith, we should abstain. So go ahead and have your personal beliefs, but don't feel like, don't go forcing them on others because it might cause somebody else to offend. You know, if you have some, a way you like doing things or you interpret scripture a certain way, as long as it's not damnable heresy, as long as it's not leading others into sin, you know, that's fine. If it's going to cause somebody else to stumble, maybe just keep it to yourself. Maybe just say, hey, you know what? If I, if I, if I start talking to this guy, he's weak in the faith, this is just going to confuse him. This is going to cause him to stumble. Then maybe we don't need to go and try and force everybody to believe you know, let me tell you where the let me tell you where the preacher's wrong. Let me tell you how I got it wrong. You know, we don't we don't need to go around doing that. Now, if I get up here and preach something that's completely heretical, by all means, call me out. By all means, get on the horn with Pastor Anderson and say, "Hey, he's teaching oneness." It's just never going to happen down here, never. <clears throat> so yeah, um, go ahead and turn over Psalms one nineteen. Psalms one nineteen. Because here's the thing. If we all agree that the Bible is our final authority, by and large, we're all going to believe the same thing. And that's why you know, I, as, as overseeing this body down here, don't have, feel like I have to go to every individual and make sure that you line up with everything. You know, and say, well, what do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? What do you believe about this? You know, I'll just get up and preach what the Bible says. And if it's a point, if, I, if it's something that you just can't abide or can't tolerate, then, you know, there's other churches. But... Here's the thing, if we all believe the Bible, we're all going to end up on the same page for the most part. He says in Psalm 119, 119, verse 45, And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. You know, you're going to have liberty when you're in the Word of God. You know, you, you have that liberty. And I'm not worried about people in this church coming up with strange and weird doctrines and, and, and doubtful disputations if they're reading their Bibles. If they're saved and they have the Holy Spirit and they're faithful to reading their Bibles, it's, it's all going to fall into place. Now, we're going to read passages that we don't understand. We're going to read things that we don't fully comprehend. And that's fine. You don't have to get everything at this, you know, all at once. But for the most part, you know, everyone's going to end up on the same page. So the, the point of the sermon is this. The, the individual soul of liberty is just teaching us that you need to believe and practice that which is right. You have the right to determine what you believe is correct. And you need to believe that for yourself. You need to practice that for yourself. And if we do that, you know, we're going to agree on the most important subjects. All the real important ones, that the, those lines that can't be crossed, I'm not worried about it. We're all going to end up on the same page because we're all reading this book and we all love his precepts. We all seek his precepts. So believe and practice that which is right. You know, and the rest will, will fall into place. Let's go ahead and pray.